whenever we do a, a conference like this is to make sure that we do everything in our power to make it as interactive a session as possible. And to do that, we rely on a little bit of technology. So for, for those of you that are attending, you know, this is not your first conference that we put on, this is probably a little bit more of a refresher. But for those of you that are attending the first time, we basically use our phones to access a website that allows you to ask questions, or if you see a question that someone else has asked, you can like it. And essentially, what that does is ensures that as we go through the course of the day, that in the very likely event we don't have enough time to, to take on every question, we can at least take on the questions that are most popular to you in the audience. I want to just encourage everybody to take advantage of the technology, take advantage of the experience and the expertise of our speakers today, because literally decades and decades and decades of experience of representing uh, the, the distributor, the winery, uh, sales and marketing agencies. We've got um, someone here from WSWA, so associations are, are represented as well. Take advantage of, of the folks that are here today, and uh, we're going to do our best to make sure that we uh, get to as many questions as we can. All right, so I think that's it. We'll get ready to kick things off. Please join me in welcoming Laura Webb to the stage, our moderator for the day. There you go. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, as George said, this has been an interesting journey over the last six months uh, that started with an article um, that I didn't even realize would turn into what we have today in front of us. Um, my, um, my day job is I, I work with, with wineries, beverage alcohol companies, as well as uh, other uh, companies within the consumer packaged goods space around uh, operationalizing, setting and operationalizing their visions for growth. Um, I work with leadership teams who um, often struggle with getting aligned around what do we want to do, where do we want to go, um, but even the harder challenge is how do we make that vision a reality. And as part of the wine industry, one of the cruxes of that question is how to break through with your distributor, particularly if you're a smaller winery or a smaller distri distillery or a craft brewer. And so uh, through the course of my work with those uh, kinds of companies, I realized there was a need to break open this conversation. Uh, we've all been to a lot of these conferences. Many of us have been to wine industry conferences, and there's this glaring omission of the topic between the supplier and distributor relationship. And it needs to be discussed. And it needs to be discussed in a way that everybody walks out feeling, um, feeling like there's opportunities, because there are. You're going to hear from a host of speakers today and panelists who I am so honored to be sitting, um, sitting around with uh, through the course of today, discussing the ways that to break through and improve that relationship between supplier and distributor. So, um, what I want to do is just tee up the discussion for today and really sort of why we're here at a more granular level. So you guys have been to conferences, right? Raise your hand if you've been to a conference. How many of you all go back to doing business exactly as you did it before? Raise your hand. I do. I love the content that I get out of conferences. But nine times out of 10, Maybe there's one topic that I go, gosh, I remember somebody said something about, uh, anyway, so go back to business as usual. We really want this conference to take a different tact, right? This is a valuable day for you all that you were taking away from work. So the purpose of today is for you all through the course of discussions and the conversations and your questions for you all to start to shift your perspective. We, I saw already, we have a lot of small small wineries and small producers here. And your distributor relationship is a point of probably contention, right? We're hoping that through the courses of conversation, you will walk away with a different view of that and start to tackle the real problem that's limiting your success in three tier. And then from that, you will hear a slew of ideas for how you can start to address those challenges more effectively in your business. But the last step is often the most critical and the, and the most overlooked, which is how will I implement those coming out of today to start to change my relationship with my distributor for the better. So my hope is, and we'll come back to this throughout the day, there's, um, there's a number of, uh, of topics that we'll, we'll dig into that start to help frame new perspectives, new ideas, and turning those ideas into action. So um, with that, 
I want to just um, talk about one more thing in the course of logistics for today. So you're going to see a series of topics. There are seven topics in all. We're kicking off with a great set of panelists who are going to set the stage for what's going on in the landscape. There's a lot of innovation happening. This is an age-old industry, but it is ever-changing, and never more than in the last five, 10 years. And so we're going to hear from a series of panelists who are going to share the market landscape with us. And, um, and I'll talk more about them in just a minute. But each session builds on itself. So we're going to start at 30,000 feet, and we're going to drill down so that by the end of the day, you all feel like you're in planning mode. You've gotten some of those implementation ideas that you all can take away from today and start to turn into action tomorrow within your organizations. Okay, great. Um, all right, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce my panelists. Um, we are thrilled to have Jake Hegman, who is from WSWA. Come on up, guys. Um, Jake is the, uh, the, the VP of Legal and Regulatory, Regulatory Affairs for WSWA. He's coming to us from Alexandria. He comes with a perspective of that wholesale environment, trade environment, and he comes at it from a regulatory um, standpoint. But he has a tremendous amount of information because he is the feet on the street of what's happening in the industry to help provide us a context that will shape the rest of the day around what are the changes going on in the marketplace, what are the trends, and how can we act upon those. We're thrilled to have Cheryl Jersey with LibDib. Many of you all have met her or heard about her. She is an innovator in the category. In a, in a traditional industry of wholesale um, uh, beverage alcohol, she is really changing the game. And so she's going to talk to us about some of the technology uh, and, uh, and insights that she has leveraged to really change the way that small suppliers can go to market. And then lastly, we have Alana Bouvier, who is the SVP of New Business Development at Young's Market. And we wanted to bring uh, Falana into the conversation because Young's is one of the most established, well-known, well-respected distributors in the US. And they're also changing their game, right? Because of the changes in the marketplace, all ships are rising. And so you have new players like Cheryl coming into the marketplace, um, coming onto the scene to provide solutions that are new and different. And you have, you have established companies like Young's who are continuing to innovate and leverage data, analytics, and technology to help address the needs of their supplier partners as much as possible. So without further ado, I am going to let Jake kick off uh, the conversation. And he is going to share a little bit of overview of the landscape. What's going on in this industry? Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? I'm doing really well because I've escaped East Coast swamp-like heat. Uh, I live in Alexandria, Virginia not Egypt, uh, and uh, work in Washington, D.C. for the Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of America, WSWA. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with the organization, but just by way of introduction, our members uh, together distribute over 80% of the wine and spirits that go to retail in the U.S. We have about 360 member companies and really have two primary functions, one of which I'm going to talk more about today. Uh, and those two functions are, one, bringing uh, together distributors and suppliers uh, to find new paths to distribution. Uh, that's done in particular through our convention that takes place each year. Uh, and then there's a side that I spend most of my time on, which is the advocacy element for the wholesale tier. We work with federal and state policymakers and really work to be part of the discussion on how beverage alcohol uh, travels through commerce in the U.S. So uh, good news and bad news. The good news, uh, I'm first. Uh, I, and the bad news about that is it is probably the driest portion of the day that you're going to get. So you're going to have to take a trip to uh, uh, the classroom with me for a moment here because I can grab the yep. clicker. Um, we're going to talk about three elements that I think help define the landscape that Laura mentioned a moment ago. So we're really at that sort of stratospheric level right now. You know, what is it when we talk about the wholesale industry, and we're going to dive much deeper later into today into specific actionable elements that suppliers um, can take to maximize the distribution relationship. But I'm going to set the stage for that the 
the land, the landscape that we're standing on when we talk about that. And there are three things that I'll touch on today. One is what are some of the trends that are driving policy changes uh, around the wholesale environment? Uh, what are some of the changes happening within the wholesale industry? And Falana and Cheryl are gonna talk in greater detail about how that works. Um, and thirdly, uh, but it's what I'll talk about first, is what are some of the legal and legislative issues that are really uh, changing, changing the playing field, both federally and at the state level? So with that in mind, uh, let's briefly talk about some of the legal and legislative elements here. Um, certainly for the wine industry, the year 2005 was a very important one. It was when the Granholm decision was rendered by the US Supreme Court. Uh, well, 14 years later, the next beverage alcohol case has made it to the Supreme Court. It's the Tennessee Wine and Spirits Retailers case. It was heard back in January. Uh, and this case deals with a question around retailers and whether retailers must be a resident of a state for a certain amount of time before they can be issued a license to do business. Um, and without getting into the nitty gritty constitutional question, um, and you've probably seen coverage of this in the, in the beverage press, there's a lot of speculation that this case will, while not being the next iteration of the Granholm decision dealing with direct shipping of wine, uh, it will likely uh, alter the sort of the, the, the bar, right, for how uh, the industry is able to enter new markets, who can potentially ship where. Um, and that decision is going to come out sometime between now and June 24th. So that's, uh, that's going to happen very shortly. And one of the things that it will do is impact a, uh, a bundle of litigation that's happening right now regarding retail direct wine shipment. Uh, there are four cases underway around the country right now dealing with this question. And these really are much closer to the Granholm case in the sense that they're asking what to what extent can states regulate the shipment of wine by retailers outside of their state to consumers in the state? Um, and so that is what many are calling kind of the Granholm II uh, series of litigation. And uh, talking about a landscape shift, that's a big one. Um, because right now I believe it's about 14 states allow retail direct wine shipping. Uh, these could potentially uh, change those numbers significantly. Um, and I'll just add too that there's some other you know issue areas that are that are happening around the beverage alcohol space, um, including uh, what kinds of entities are eligible to enter the enter the in particular the retail market in Texas. Walmart uh, was denied a license to sell spirits in the state because it's a publicly traded company. They challenged the law that prohibited that. That was appealed and was heard by the Fifth Circuit there earlier this year. Um, and would, and this I realize is on the spirit side, but you know that's a that's obviously a very very significant retailer um, who would be entering, you know, if this law were overturned, entering that marketplace. So we think about new retailers, which is something I'll touch on in a second. And lastly, I'll just add um, there are newer approaches that that some parties are bringing to, to to challenge existing laws. You know, a lot of when you look at alcohol codes. Many of these laws have been in place for a very long time. I would submit often with very good reason. Um, but one of the things we've seen is challenges, including First Amendment free speech challenges to some of these laws in Missouri. Uh, the advertising regulations there regulating uh, how retailers can advertise uh, promotional events um, were challenged and were thrown out in a federal district court um, being viewed as, uh, as a limitation on free, commercial free speech. Um, so those are a couple of the legal challenges that are sort of moving the boundaries of the of the beverage alcohol space at large. I'd add too that being a largely state regulated industry, um, the legislative front is very very active. And uh, when you look across the country, I, I get the dubious distinction of looking at uh, several thousand pieces of legislation a year. Um, Two things really pop to mind, and these will touch on the trends uh, that we talk about in a moment. Uh, delivery is really at the front and center uh, for a lot of lawmakers. Connecting consumers to re the retail experience in new ways, um, whether that be third party delivery, whether that be shipping, uh, whether that be curbside delivery. Uh, there are many, many iterations uh, of that, that last mile, if you will, that 
laws didn't contemplate when they were written, and state legislatures are really taking a deep look at how to best do that. And secondly, I'd add that states are really looking at um, what is retail today? Um, retail is looking more and more uh, different than, than ever before, uh, whether it be new on-premise licensees. Um, I often point to the rise of the pedal pub. Has anyone here been on a pedal pub? Uh, it's a fun experience unless you have to be the driver who cannot be drinking a beer while doing it, but these are like four to six person bicycles that, uh, that you pedal around town and enjoy a beer on. Well, that's a retail license location. Uh, and states have had to develop uh, laws to accommodate uh, events like that. I would say, in a more serious note, the real rise in, in new retail licensees revolves around special events. And the number of time-limited event licenses that are taking place, music festivals certainly being kind of at the core of that. But um, there's a real rise. And I would, I would say, as a winemaker, where do you and your products fit within those new retail environments? Because these do not look like wine shops from 20 years ago. And uh, just to hammer that home, this is from uh, the National Beer Wholesalers, but this graph represents uh, retail at large. Um, total beverage alcohol retail establishments on and off beer, wine, and spirit, beer, wine, and or spirits. Um, and I think the point here is, in the last decade, while it's flattened in the last two years, there's been over 100,000 new licensed retailers in the US marketplace. That's a lot of stops for a distributor's trucks to make. That's a lot of product that's gotta go to these marketplaces. And I would again ask what product is going there and what's the right product for that? And I think we're gonna hear a lot more about that later today. Shifting away from that space and this, I know many in the room are following far more closely than I am. I pulled just three clips that I were on top of mind the other day, but I think the trend landscape is talking about things in flux, really in flux. Um, the millennial discussion could be a day long discussion of its own, but uh, there's real questions emerging about, you know, where are younger legal drinking age consumers going to spend their time and money? Um, delivery, again, bringing the, what was once an on-premise experience into essentially an off-premise experience and what products are gonna be part of that experience, that occasion, um, and certainly the on, uh, Pizza Hut's a great example, this is with beer, but you know, traditional on-premise retailers working to capture that consumer who no longer frequents the on-premise establishment. Um, and this is a bit of a shameless plug, but I think this is really relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, when we talk about trends, WSWA just a week ago released a first of its kind data product uh, called the SIP source report. This is the first time that distributor depletion data for both on and off premise has been aggregated. And this includes data from uh, all of the large multi-state distributors, including Young's Market, among other others, um, and some smaller single state and, and small multi-state distributors, and the list is growing. It is depletion data in the wine context for over 71,000 SKUs going to over 320,000 retail outlets on and off premise. Um, the data itself is, is within the report, but a couple trends that I pulled from the wine side that I think are notable. Um, and, and again, this is really the first time we're seeing this kind of depletion, depletion data for licensed states. Uh, but you know, it's not all rosy. Um, and while spirits and wine continue to be success stories, among, certainly relative to beer, spirits performance has been strong. And at least in the recent quarters, there's been a, a slowing trend in the wine sector, both on and off, but greater in the off channel. Um, and along with that, and this data on DTC is from Sovos by Ship Compliant. I'm not sure if anyone's here from there today, and Wines Finds Analytics. But uh, while growth remains robust in DTC, it too is slowed. So you know, these are just questions that, that one needs to ask about where are these trend lines going and how do you stay relevant in these changing times. Um, and premiumization was in survey data from this project, uh, 
was sort of the, the word of the word of the report. Dollar sales are up, volumes are down, uh, you know, or flat to down, but dollar sales up as people continue to trade up uh, pretty much across the board. Um, and again, some of those trends that came out of this, and this was also, we do a 300 uh, person survey of supplier and distributor executives, um, you know, questions and, and, and things to watch for. Again, this question of the baby boomer sort of traditional wine consumer uh, demographic aging out of uh, peak, uh, you know, years. Um, and what does replacement, uh, you know, what do new, new drinkers, you know, wine consumers look like? Uh, the real questions around that health and wellness continues to be a huge question as people explore, um, you know, sort of the relationship with alcohol consumption, uh, and and this this theme of uh, continued expansion of on and off premise and what you know what is that defined as, um, and the uh, the role that e-commerce will play um, going forward. And lastly, I won't I won't dive into it here. Uh, it's its own conference, in fact, but uh, the role of cannabis. Uh, in the beverage alcohol landscape. So uh, um, I'm going to skip through that. But uh, to tie this up, I think what, what, what's really relevant for today, and this is where I'll turn it over to, to Cheryl, uh, um, is that you know, the industry itself, you know, what are distributors doing, given all of these things I just talked about? You know, certainly, consolidation is an item that makes the headlines within the beverage media. Um, but I think there's another story that is equally, if not more important, especially for small and mid-sized suppliers, and that is the growth of new distributors. And this is something we're really proud of at WSWA, is seeing new distributors enter the marketplace. Cheryl is one of them, uh, but there are many others, uh, and they're representing, I will, I will call it often, the niche areas of the business. Um, I have several examples in recent months of talking to new distributors uh, specializing in very, very narrow areas. In this case, I'm thinking of imported, imported wine categories, but they've pursued that and they're pursuing it with great passion and are wonderful advocates for those products. And I think we're seeing this real excitement in the industry around how distributors are partnering with suppliers to form very strong, very strong bonds uh, to bring both both businesses forward, um, and then this is the segue to to LibDib. But I think the last piece that what what true in distribution, like it is in almost any business category today, is that around technology, and you know the days of a uh, a paper invoice uh, being phoned in are uh, are rapidly uh, falling behind us, uh, and. Two examples of this are really the integration, I'll call it integration of the experience for retailer, distributor, and supplier. And Cheryl will talk more about ERNDC in a moment, but um, there are platforms across many of the large suppliers and small, uh, excuse me, large distributors uh, uh, that, are, that are bringing this e-platform to retailers to look at new products, um, be able to understand what they are, see things, it's almost this infinite shelf idea. Um, seeing what's out there and, and, and having more information at your fingertips, allow, empowering retailers and certainly empowering a supplier who's part of that platform for their product to reach more consumers. Um, so with that, let me turn it to Cheryl to talk about how that actually works in real life. Great, thank you. That was not dry at all, right? He's really good, <laughs> really good. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's my Cheryl Dersey. I'm the CEO and founder of LibDib, Liberation Distribution. Um, I think I have a couple slides, but I'll, I'll talk to, I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how I got here and how probably we all got here. Um, my um, background is, I'm, I'm you. I was in the wine industry. Um, my family owns a winery. I managed the wholesale side of the business for over 15 years. Probably worked with over 200 distributors in my career as in sales and wholesaler management. And um, we, just like what Jake said, it, it changed. The evolution or the, the landscape of the wholesale tier was changing. You had consolidation. You also had the, the, the new players coming online. You had, um, you know, it, it, so many more producers. That is another big part of what has been happening in this industry is, 
you know, we're at over 10,000 wineries in the United States alone. You have craft spirits um, taking some of that market share, let alone craft beer. So there's just the this huge proliferation of suppliers. And, and we, you know, at LibDib, we call them makers. Um, so huge, huge prolifer- proliferation of makers. Um, and then you also have uh, this landscape of the changing consumer. Consumers are... Um, they have never had more access to information via their phones at the retail level. You can learn so much about something within minutes. They they seek authenticity. They see you know the health and wellness part of it that that Jake mentioned, and they seek um, you know small production, um, authentic, family owned, local types of products. And often those are very small production. So when you kind of look at the overall um, you know model of the wholesaler. And how many product? You know, there's there's problems both on the supplier side, on the on the winery side, and then there's problems on the wholesaler side with taking in products that they, you know, that they're taking a bet on excess inventory, all kinds of mm-hmm. different issues that made me kind of come to the conclusion that I think technology can solve um, both sides of the equation. We can we can work with all the small any small supplier that wants access to the three tier system can have it through technology and how can we do that and how can we build a, a supplier portal where anyone can go in put their information upload their licenses and then they are they are able to sell within this marketplace and then on the other side you have every licensed retailer that can go in search curate products learn about them and purchase them and it's a legal transaction to ship it one case at a time so that was um, that's what we built. Uh, we've been live for two very it seems like very long and very <laughs> short years, <laughs> um, and we've recently partnered with the second largest distributor in the United States, which is uh, Republic National Distributing Company. My goal is to be a licensed wholesaler in every state when any winery distillery can get on our platform and sell to any licensed. Uh, retailer or restaurant one case at a time. Um, I believe that everybody, when you have access, you're going to see a lot of things that you haven't seen before. So data is going to become really, really interesting. I also believe that we can act as an incubator. Um, you know, you, you talk to a lot of, uh, of wholesalers and some of their pain points are, oh, I, you know, I take these chances on these products and then they go and they sit for 12 months and it's aging and it's, you know, these are the some of these issues and how can we utilize technology and LibDib to take, you know, have those products and, and let the market decide and let the, let them see how the, how they react in the marketplace and then graduate them up through the process. And we've already seen that with our platform. We've had some brands that have, that have graduated to Young's and to graduated to, to big, to big distributors. And that's really our goal. We take this long tail of the industry, we put them into our platform and we see, um, you know, kind of what the market is interested in and then they can kind of go to the next step. So another really important part of what we do is compliance. Um, I, uh, I'm a member of WSWA. They've been super helpful in guiding us into how um, every shipment can be a compliant shipment because it's different by state, it's different by type of alcohol, it's different by establishment. So it, and that's what, how technology has been really cool. We've been able to, to set, the, set the stage and make sure that when a, you know, when a case of uh, Chardonnay is ordered from um, Scarpettos in New York, it gets there in the right way. Does it hit a dock? Does it go direct? Does it sit for a while? All that kind of stuff. So that's been super helpful with, with the organization. Um, and I think I touched on the other one. And then the last point, like my goal is, like I said, product incubation, passing things up, and then also we want to be every brand's first distributor. So we have a lot of really cool tools that will help um, our makers, that help our makers sell and to connect with buyers. We also um, do a lot of education. We have weekly webinars. We have experts come in and, and tell you how to sell in kind of this new and evolving world, how to, what do you do when it comes to this virtual shelf and to managing online retailers. Uh, so then we can hopefully take them to the next step and pass them on up. So I'll, this is a good opportunity to pass it on up. So thank you. And I look forward to uh, meeting you all today and, and talking more about, about distribution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, this one? Hi, I'm Falana Bouvier. I'm the distributor. <laughs> um, 
you can tell I'm the distributor because I'm up here armed with the most stuff to defend me. <laughs> so I'm the senior vice president for a new business development, lead generation, new and current supplier engagement, and part-time psychologist at times. Um, we've been in business for 131 years. Fifth generation owned, led continuously longest, one of the longest running distributors in the United States. And we have been through so many different kinds of innovation and technology. Young's Market, you know, for the 131 years that they've been in business, which is run by the Underwood family and the uh, foundation and our CEO, Chris Underwood, they have been through, you know, we're still standing. And the reasons for that is we have invested heavily into not only technology, but also people. And some of the examples I'll give is we, inve we recognize the need to address the fine wine industry. So many, a few years ago, just a few years ago, we invested in our East Coast wholesale operations, which is called w Wilson Daniels. I'm sure many of you guys have heard of Wilson Daniels, which is run by a fantastic gentleman named Rocco Lombardo. Not only that, but we have decided to increase our warehouse systems in Washington and Oregon, for those that may not know. And we have a fantastic fine wine estates group team here in California as well as expanding our craft spirits team. We have created uh, new systems called Young's Direct, which is an e-commerce online system that we have. We have a tell cell, a brand new tell cell wholesale organization for online, uh, online retail, as well as we innovated and decided to migrate to a new Oracle, uh, Oracle 360, which is a new ERP system. And we've invested into 750 Daily, as well as Salesforce.com. So as many things that is happening with technology, the one, um, what's important for everyone to know about Young's Market Company is that we are still in the people business. And this is still a relationship business. And as much as we want to innovate and grow our technology, some of the challenges that we've seen is you also don't want to hide behind the technology either. You still need to get out from your office and, and out in front of your desk and work with us as a distributor. It doesn't have to be contentious. And it is about a partnership and about being relevant and resonating with each other. So that's, uh, that's Young's Market Company. Great. Thank you all so much. This is a um, round of applause for our speakers. Um, it, this is just, it's such an interesting perspective to hear from each of you as a representative of the industry at a 30,000 foot view. A WSWA really is the amalgamator of all wholesalers and as a, and as a rep, Repre representation of, of the wholesale system. And uh, no one better to, to share sort of what's changing in the marketplace um, than, than WSWA. But what's also interesting is how you all are starting. You all are really innovating. And, and um, in addition to the creation of new players like LibDib and the innovation that's happening with established players like Young's, I'm just I'm fascinated by this idea of um, all three of these folks have talked about how um, how critical it is to add value. And we're going to talk a lot about that today, that adding value to your stakeholders, be it your membership community, be it your, your, your big brother distributor that you're handing off to, your retailers, your end consumer, um, your supplier partners, adding value is tremendously important. And even more so in an industry like this that is so extremely complicated, simplification is key. We talked, uh, I think you talked a little bit about, um, Jake, the idea of convenience. And convenience is as relevant of a concept to consumers as it is to this wholesale system. In a, in a complex system, how do we as suppliers create simplicity? And how do those distributors create simplicity for their trade partners? And then those trade partners in turn create simplicity for their, uh, for their, their consumers. So um, with that, what I'd like to do is just, um, I know we've got, uh, as a reminder, Slido, you all should be practicing your use of technology right now. Um, if, if you don't mind, Nick, if we can pull that up. Um, I want to pull up the questions that, that have percolated to the top. Um, and also, so you guys know, there is a workbook that walks you through each section. You have a little overview of the speakers. There is a section to take, uh, to take notes. Um, so, so please do that, because we'll refer to it at the end of, end of the day. But what I'd love to start off with um, as we jump into questions here is what you guys, if you all had a crystal ball, what do you envision 
Um, what, what do you see around the next bend in terms of evolution and innovation of the wholesale system? What's coming next? Well, I'll try and talk loudly. Um, <laughs> but, but I think one of the things that, that I see is this continued, I, I'm looking a little bit more at the wholesale retail consumer mm -hmm. uh, end in, in, in my day to day. Um, and when we talk about convenience, I think one example would be, again, thinking about how wholesalers are working with retailers to ensure that the retail consumer experience is as seamless as possible. Mm -hmm. And if everyone upstream of that isn't thinking that way, there's a real vulnerability. Yeah. And you know, one of the things uh, that we did at WSWA uh, over four years ago was we formed a strategic partnership with Drizzly, uh, which is, uh, we believe, the leading online uh, third-party platform for retailers to connect consumers to products. And I'll give you one example of convenience that that brings. You know, on your phone, I sit at my desk in Washington, D.C., and uh, I have 1,400 SKUs of bourbon that can be delivered in one hour to that office um, because that system is shopping across I don't have the exact number. Last count, it was, I believe, 30 retailers in the city. Um, and it's giving that consumer an unparalleled shopping experience. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm a supplier, I want to be thinking about you know, who are the people downstream from me? Is my wholesaler thinking about that? Mm -hmm. Is my, are the retailers that they're working with thinking about how that consumer has that opportunity? Mm -hmm. um, because uh, my observation is that that's where a consumer is headed today, is that ability to, uh, to have that experience. So, and that's embarrassing because it was working the whole time. Uh, so probably nobody heard my, my rants and raves about retail uh, convenience. But um, uh, I will cede my time there. Thoughts on convenience and where wholesalers are, are going to uh, connect connect the supply retail consumer continuum. Yeah. I mean that's I agree too. I think that um, I think you you're going to see a lot more shopping online. I mean I and I think it's going to happen in the grocery channel um, faster than we all mm -hmm. think. It started of course I'm in the middle of Silicon Valley so I'm like I'm Instacart 100% mm -hmm. all the time. I never go to the grocery store anymore, but it's going to expand across uh, the country and it's going to you're going to see that, like I said, this virtual shelf thing is super interesting, especially to me. And I've been talking to some really big um, buyers at, you know, at grocery channels and, and a lot of big retailers about how, you know, <laughs> how cool would it be if you can have, you upload your product, your wine, your cool small production Cabernet Franc from, you know, cool little vineyard down the street, whatnot. And all of a sudden it's on the shelf in Ohio. I mean, that is, and that's a legal three-tier, through the distributor, through the everything transaction, everyone's taxes are paid, et cetera, et cetera, and the consumer can buy it. That I find really interesting and what I like to call automatic points of distribution where, and we've started those talks with the folks at Drizzly and with various um, uh, retailers of how someone can get onto our platform and then all of a sudden um, show up online at a retailer across the country. I think that's mm -hmm. super powerful and really interesting and um, solves a lot of, again, a lot of the pain points with shipping and um, getting things across state lines and, and having it all be, um, you know, legal and three-tier compliant. I, you know, on the winery side, I did a lot of work with direct-to-consumer as well, and you still have these issues. Mm -hmm. It costs a lot of money to ship a case of wine yeah. across the country. I mean, it's yeah. like 40 bucks, it's like 40, 50 bucks. So, um, you know, being able to have that retail kind of presence and mm -hmm. opportunity, whether it's online or on a shelf, I think... Um, will be a big part of, of where we're going. Great. Um, for, for Young's, we're very focused on obviously the customer and making sure that the customer has the ability to order whenever they want. You know, the age of the buyer today at, the, at your liquor store, craft spirit house, restaurant, is a different generation. You know, they're ordering at different times and they want the product <laughs> delivered at what's convenient for them. Mm -hmm. And so what Young's is focused on, we created Young's Direct, which is an e-online e you know, site so, so people can go online and order directly from us. What we've done is we've decided to have teams and accounts, um, account reps and account teams 
to call on some of these buyers directly to have more of a one-on-one -on -one touch point, which is very important. And when we uh, decide to make the decisions, to, you know, we want to work more with retailers across the country and invite them to, to tell us what they are looking for. And I think we're just spending more time listening to our customers as well. You know, being in, uh, being in the industry for 131 years, Young's has learned <laughs> that, is, that at the end of the day, it is about the customer first and foremost. So that's our, that's our number, one, number one priority. Great. Valana, I want to stick with you for just a minute here. There, there is this burning question that kind of is the elephant in the room. Um, and we, again, I just I want to reiterate how grateful we are to have distributor representation here, right? We can't have this conversation without you all because you all are the voice that is, is missing at the table um, in trying to figure out this equation. Um, so a, a number of people are asking, you know, these are small, small suppliers sitting in the room. It, how, how are they supposed to think about um, the, the idea of a, a big Young's, Young's market or big like traditional distributor and the role of a small supplier in that system? Is there a real role for small suppliers? Absolutely, their there's a real role for a small supplier. It is about, as again, as I said, it's about relationships and being able to work with us and resonating and working well with us. We have so many examples of small suppliers that really still, that carry a big stick with us. And the reason they carry a big stick with us is because they come with programming and they come to help the distributor because the role of a distributor is to distribute and to execute. The role of the supplier is consumer pool. And when you have a supplier that comes into the office and wants us to be responsible for consumer pool as well as marketing, and all the PR, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. very difficult. We're not able to do that. But our job and sole responsibility is we need to get the product there for you. And we need to make sure we execute mm -hmm. for you. And we need to make sure that there's communication and it's clear on both sides. When there isn't any clear communication from both sides and you're being, you know, either side is, you know, we we want your business. We want to work with small, medium, and large suppliers mm -hmm. because you never know who the next Tito's is going to be right. or who the next Rombauer Charnay will be. You, you just don't know that. And at the end of the day, people want to work with people they like. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, no one wants to get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, right? It's a marriage. And it's about being, it's, it's, it's communication. You know, I look at my role. I receive 90 requests a day to get into our business. Think about that. 90 requests a day. And I really look at each proposition, and I look at background, I look at the people, I look at financial stability. And if you come to me, and you, you don't have to have everything, but if you have you know, your ducks in an order, and you have realistic expectations, the pricing is realistic, and you have an authentic story, then absolutely you have a chance. You don't have to have billions of dollars and all these things that I think small suppliers, they get... I think disenchanted mm -hmm. because they see us spending more time with maybe a mid or larger supplier. But we spend a lot of time actually with smaller suppliers because the story is fantastic, because the people are great, and they're treating us professionally with respect. And that is what it is about because if you think about energy, and you are always going to want to be around people that are happy and are energetic. But if you're around someone that's complaining and upset and like, going to go after you all the time, do you want to spend time with that person? Probably not, right? You don't want to sell their brands. But if you're there as a resource for us and we can collaborate together as a partner, then absolutely there is a chance. And Falana, thank you so much for, um, she's, your comments have just started to give a little preview of some of, the, some of the granularity we're going to go into later in the day. And what does it really take to develop that, that working, positive relationship um, where Right? Every party that comes to the table has their own needs. And how do you start to think about the needs of the party sitting across the table from you and address those in a way that's realistic and feasible um, so that both, both parties can get what they need and want out of the relationship? Um, Jake and Cheryl, I'd like to ask you, there's a couple questions around sort of different go-to-market models. Um, there's a question about the, how a broker is similar or different from um, a traditional distributor and um, a, a question about the, um, the role of Merchant 23 and its relevance in three tier. Can you all talk about some of those other sort of routes to market and innovations within route to market um, and how they fit in the big picture? Cool. I'll start with the broker question. Um, 
Look, I, you know, and this is this is a lot of what I did when I was working at the winery was, you know, you still, whether you're with the distributor or yourself dib or you're with Live Dib, you still need to be out there building relationships. You need to be out there. You can't just, it's just like you can't post something online and expect it to sell. You can't just sell a pallet to Young's and expect it to sell. You have to, you have to work. And I'll tell you, being in, you know, on the wholesaler side of things now and also seeing what's happening in craft spirits those people hustle. Like, they are out there. <laughs> They're working hard. And it's, it's you, you got to continue to do that. So um, a broker is, you know, not a licensed entity, but they are, you know, they're kind of like hired feet on the street. I totally get it. Like, a lot of wineries are one, two-man operations, <laughs> and you don't have time. You can't do everything. You can't make the wine and sell it and be in the tasting room and do the wine club and do everything. So a broker can be a really good opportunity to have someone who already has established relationships and can go out and help you build your um, your customers and your and your sales with your distributor. Mm-hmm. Um, my experience, my suppliers, you know, we have over 500 suppliers on our platform platform amongst the three states that we're live in right now. Um, it, my experience, there's no one who tells the story better than the maker themselves, and that to me is a really good. Uh, sales tool. I, I highly recommend that people use them if they take their own passion and go out and out in the street and 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 share that. You will be successful. Um, I think there's different ways to do it outside of just 100% walking into a, walking into a, a a restaurant or a retailer. I think you can start conversations um, through email, through phone calls, through FaceTime. Bring people in the cellar, you know, virtually. All these mm-hmm. kinds of neat tools that we have. I believe that those can be great. Can, can help as well. But there really is, and going back to the brokers, if you can find a broker that can take your passion and bring it into the marketplace, absolutely. You have to find those people. Those people are what I would call gold. I don't think yeah. that they're, I, I don't think they're super easy to find, mm-hmm. but when you do have someone, I, you know, that's a, that's a really good um, sales tool. And I would just add to that, that, I, that with the broker element, you want to know where you want to have a broker. Um, one of the things we hear from from members routinely is, you know, you know that the, a supplier really. You, do you know where you want to be and why? Um, and that a fifty state strategy is not necessarily the first step that one should take. And so, you know, asking those questions, looking at the data that's out there. This is one thing uh, that you know we we strive for with the SIP source product is being able to look at a state level of you know category and in the wine in the case of wine into the varietal level you know what's trending where right Mm -hmm. you want to know those things and having that guide you and say hey you know maybe the broker resource is good in these markets um that's important data to have Mm -hmm. rather than the the shotgun approach um which which may work uh but but you know you need to think long and hard about what what strategy is right for you great um, I do want to chat about um, going back to the Sur- Supreme Court uh, rulings. Um, how how some of as these as these decisions play out, how do you all feel it will affect players like Wine.com and Amazon, and what are the implications for for smaller suppliers in terms of putting the spotlight on on those outlets as as potential channels? Well, I think the the, the case that's before the Supreme Court now, um, it, it's it's. Many expect it to be a narrow ruling dealing okay. with this question around must a retailer reside in, in the right. state that they do business in. Now, if you happen to listen to the oral argument, um, mm-hmm. uh, Amazon was actually referenced mm-hmm. in that um, because that was what some of the justices viewed as the natural extension mm-hmm. of this. If you say, hey, a retailer, a retailer can be anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I, I certainly don't have a crystal ball, um, but uh, I do know that jurisprudence tends to not move at lightning pace. Um, uh, many think this will sort of be an incremental step um, that um, changes the requirements, to, you know, narrowly to be a retailer. But um, but as has come up several times here, I think what what will not go away, regardless of the this case and any future cases, is right. is the demand, the very real demand that consumers, and reasonable demand that consumers have to connect them with great products. And great is a very subjective thing. You know, Falana pointed out some of the elements that people are looking for, you know, real, authentic, right? You know, the story, certainly the price, right? There's a whole spectrum. 
but that's not going away. And the chain that goes from supply to consumer mm -hmm. that fits that best yeah. is going to, I think, ultimately be yeah. su most successful. Great. Um, this question is for, for any one of you all. All of you all can answer it. Um, but Jake, each of you guys have talked about access to information as, as a really sort of critical change in, in the landscape. Um, this, is, this is an industry that has traditionally been very closed in terms of availability of, of in industry information. Um, and I'd like for you all to, to share your insights on, on why that is becoming so prevalent um, and what are the, what are, how do suppliers, small suppliers, need to think about the importance of access to information um, as, as a key component in the way that they innovate in doing business? That's a good question. <laughs> um, for Young's, what we've done is we've expanded and just really focused on dedicated resources because Everyone that comes into the onboarding process as a new f a supplier, especially fine wine or a small spirit supplier, we want to dedicate to you a portfolio person or your own fine wine ex uh, expert in the building at the, at the distributor to help navigate you through the process to get you the information that you need. Not everyone is techn technologically savvy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what we've learned. Even our own <laughs> senior managers, I'll have to admit. So we want to make sure that there's still a touch point. You know, I, I do, and, and this is something that I, I believe strongly about, as important as it is to innovate and to increase your technology, and we invest heavily, it's important not to hide behind the technology either. Because when you hide behind the technology, you don't solve the problem. And a lot of the times, Find small suppliers, especially fine wine and even on the spirit side, the problem that they have of not being able to assess or access data could be something very simple if someone were able to pick up the phone and talk to them. And so for us, we really just focus on increasing dedicated resources, feet on the street, and people that are there to help walk you through the process of what you need, to, what kind of data that you need. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's great. I hide behind the technology. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we also have live people too. It's very different. But we, our platform, like uh, I like to, I like to say, I'm, I might be have a little bit of bias. I like to say it's really intuitive, and people can log in and just get the information that they need. Um, in terms of, you know, not just how to use the platform, but how to navigate the three tier system. Because I'm super passionate about that. We have a lot of content and a lot of information within the platform for people to to learn about it and how to work with mm -hmm. um, wholesalers big and small. I mean, we just had a, a great hour-long webinar um, with an expert who had some really awesome ideas and tools that, you know, and then all of the, those recordings and things live within, within our platform. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm all about transparency, like um, very much about um, sharing of information and training <coughs> people on how to how to start how to start working with a distributor. There's, you know, you gotta start with, start with case one. <laughs> just start with case one, because sometimes it can be super overwhelming. Yeah, great. Can you talk just a little bit, uh, sort of tag on to, onto that, um, to finish this, this idea out around sort of how SIP source could be a tool for, for small suppliers? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the place we're trying to go with SIP source is that we're gonna have a resource that people can get pretty granular with. If you wanna look at yeah. a state, and, and ultimately, it's not there today, but ultimately it will be, you know, you can look at a state for a category and, mm -hmm. and see what's been happening. Mm -hmm. And, Great. you know, that's, that's a level we haven't gone to, and in particular, uh, being able to separate on and off-premise uh, depletion. Okay. So Great. that's awesome. where we want to go. Fabulous. Um, can we talk a little bit about, there's, there's been a couple questions about um, franchise states and any changes happening in franchise states, particularly there's a question on you know, how, how you're going to address the franchise state uh, challenge. Uh, so maybe we I'm start to do Keisha. whatever's legal. No. <laughs> um, but look, I, I understand some of the, I mean, most of my, again, my business model is this massive long tail of the industry, which I is continuing to grow. So it's the small producers selling 10 cases a month, you know, in, in 10 markets, that kind of a thing is what, is what I'm looking for. So most of the franchise states have the case quantities that I would fall under anyway, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily matter. If there is that, my plan, and I can't 
commit to anything because I don't know the legalities in every single state. But my plan is, look, you're out there. You're the one who's building your brand. I am not mm -hmm. investing in salespeople. I am not taking resources away from other things to, um, to, to, to build your brand and to keep, make those case sales. I certainly understand, um, especially with some of the, you know, some of the folks I've met at WSW, these, these suppliers who have spent years and years and years building these brands and lots of money and lo and then all of a sudden it gets taken and pulled away from them for no apparent business reason. That's a, that's an issue mm -hmm. for a business. It's a, it's still a business. We're all yeah. still here to be business. So, um, my model is not really like that. We're not going to be selling, but if someone's selling thousands of cases a month, then they're going to be with, with someone at like Young's market. So. Right. Great. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Cheryl. That's, that's really helpful. Um, so uh, let's shift gears just a bit and talk about um, the, sort of the big innovation on the supplier side has been sort of the rise of, of DTC over, over the last 10 years. And, and I know many suppliers who have just begun to sort of rely on that channel because it's, it's a channel that can be controlled. You have direct access to your consumers and, and thus has sort of created a, a retreat um, to some degree, maybe not a complete walking away, but an, a reliance on DTC over three tier. Um, love to ha hear from you all how you expect, um, sort of what you see as best practices in terms of going for the balance between those two and sort of the role of, of both um, to ensure that you know, there's optimal diversification happening for suppliers as well as sort of the best growth opportunities. Sure, I'll take that. Um, so direct to consumer, you know, especially in the like, like in the last ten years with the changing landscape of the wholesaler. I mean, wine clubs, um, on pro, you know, tasting rooms, all of those things, super important. I think that being involved in the wholesale channel can complement that. Um, I, you know, one of the best examples that I see of this was um, is uh, cake bread. So cake bread has this incredible. I think it's a, one of the largest wine clubs in in the United States, and um, but. The cake bread family, Dennis Cake Bread in particular, is out at doing wine dinners across the country and having his wine clubs come to these on-premise establishments that feature his wines and um, building it out through these local channels. Mm -hmm. So when people buy that, yeah, they might be part of the cake bread wine club, but they are also buying cake bread in restaurants. They are going to their retail establishments yep. and buying cake bread. So it, I believe it's totally complimentary, but you have to... Again, it's it's working it. It's hustling. It's making sure that you're mm -hmm. um, doing that that you know taking your business outside of just the tasting room in the wine club and expanding it amongst your fans and encouraging them to also buy through the um, retail and on premise establishments. Great. Any other additions there? No, I think that that, that it's definitely a complementary yeah. relationship. I think the specifics of it are are pretty case driven. Um, just quickly, and I, I completely agree, Cheryl, is when it comes to DTC, it's important to have a successful digital marketing plan. So when you go into the wine tasting room and you have that connection, that consumer-facing connection, and then you're able to connect that digitally through social mm -hmm. media, and you have that successful 360, that is something that complements the wholesale side. Because then when you're walking in with a distributor rep and you're working with us on your planning, we actually can track your data and track the sales of how that's how that's able to connect the consumer to the marketplace and really bring it all together. And so in that aspect, I think it's very important that when you have, I mean, Hess family does a fantastic yeah. job. They have a very successful um, d digital marketing campaign called Lead the Lion, and they've done a fantastic job of being able to connect the consumer. You go to the, uh, to the winery, and you're able to see what they're talking about, and then it connects on social media, and it pops up, you know, in your like, you know, everyday life. Right. And so when you have that consistency, I think that's important. It also helps with the wholesale channel. Balana, thank you for sharing that, um, both of you. I think it's really, it's really helpful to hear. And to be clear, what I'm hearing is that DTC is not seen as in competition no, with not. the wholesale channel. And I think. Um, you all may feel differently, but I hear that a lot. That, um, gosh, distributors think that you know they don't want to hear anything about our DTC channel. They, you know, they'd rather that we don't even have it because they want to sell through them. You know, they want to sell. They want us to sell through them. Um, when in reality, I think it is. It is such. What I'm hearing is that it's a compliment, um, and it actually helps reinforce confidence within that wholesale structure that you have a brand that has some traction. Yeah, I mean, if you are. 
at a dinner party and your you know and your and your girlfriends are you know pulling up their social media your friends and and they see and they and they decide to buy a wine and you go to the you know and you're like wow we distribute that wine and your friends are well i found it on instagram because i connected through their social media platform and it's that's successful for us we want that we want people to be buying the wines that we distribute so we don't look at that as a competition at all if anything right. youngs is looking to learn and educate themselves more in that channel so we can better serve our customer. Great. Can any of you all talk about emerging markets, right? We know sort of the big, the big states, you know, the big five that are dominate, you know, currently dominating. Any trends you all see in terms of rising stars that, um, that wine, the wine business, both on the wholesale, the retail, the consumer side, are really sort of gaining traction that you have a particular eye on? I would just be tracking where, popu where the population is. Yeah. I mean, the, the number of people moving to Texas every month is mm -hmm. significant. The number of people moving to the Denver metro area mm -hmm. is very significant. And there are a lot of other stories like that. Mm -hmm. um, and those are areas, when you look at the median salaries, they're very high. Yep. Any other thoughts on that? I think everyone should go to Hawaii. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Very relaxing. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, given given that you know launching and developing a new brand, um, you know could start with could start with a live dib evolve um, when it grows up a bit to um, to a young's uh, type partner. At what point of um, and even even prior to that, the the business may be dominated by DTC. At what point of production do you all see there's an opportunity to really enter into into three tier? And any sort of best practices that you say, you know, these are this is how to start the ball rolling. And we're going to talk about this a whole lot today. So um, any opening salvos on that? I think that if you can like through our platform, you know, like I said, one case at a time. There's no reason not to start the process. Um, even if you're, if you're, if you have a point where you need to sell a case somewhere and you don't have a place to sell it, why not try to get started going with the three tier? Um, I, you know, do it before you have years and years of inventory built up. <laughs> um, and the more you start building those relationships with the buyers, you know, getting to know the folks at, at you know, getting your wines into the into the places you want to see them, the better. I mean, you don't have to sell all of your production, but you can have 25 cases in the top restaurants in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and it takes time to build those relationships. So start start as soon as you can. Uh, I brought along a checklist. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here are some of the things that Young's looks for if you want to get into the whole cell, the three-tier system, leaving LibDib, right? So we look for if you, and we also ask for you to educate us on category strength, key points of differentiation from what exists in their current marketplace. Um, you know, your willingness to be in all the states. You know, own your home market. I think that's very important. Uh, the impact on your relationship with your current business and your customers. Is the brand attractive and poised for growth? Are you planning on growing the brand? Or do you want to just keep it the way it is? Do you have a minimal production? Do you have capacity? Because if you want Young's to just, you know, go at it and build to a thousand points of distribution, don't run out of stock. <laughs> um, volume potential is very important. Consumer uh, proposition and the likelihood of customer buy-in. Supplier stability and financial strength. And lastly, are the economics of the brand attractive? So your profit and case margin are more, you know, know your finances and know your margins for the brands. The, your financial stability, pricing position, be realistic with your pricing, and uh, you know ensure that your brand can over deliver for the price. If you know, we have so many examples where the brands have come in; they've been so successful at a certain price. All of a sudden, they want to do a price increase, and they expect Youngs to do the exact same, even you know a twenty percent increase over last year. It's important to be realistic and to give us some time to make sure that we understand why the brand's successful and how we can be successful with you. Great. I have one more question, and Falana, your your comments um, just now are such a great opener for the discussions that we're going to have later in the day. Um, so I want to I want to hold hold any additional questions on that because there's a lot up here that all we're going to be addressing in just a bit. But I want to close by asking one more question. Um, WSWA is sort of this powerhouse organization, right? That probably many of you all are thinking, you know, that's just for the big guys. What? 
What can smaller suppliers glean in terms of insight and support and help from organizations like WSWA? And are there other organizations or resources that small suppliers can tap into that have emerged or always been there that are, are sort of the hidden tools to help them uh, do the work that they need to do to connect with, um, with the wholesale system more effectively? Right, well, I think one of the things we've done th this year, uh, we revamped how we approach our convention mm -hmm. uh, to have an entire day dedicated to uh, supplier level issues oh, and great. really focusing on you know, entrance to the distribution landscape. Right. Um, that was a recognition that you know, we need to do more to help bridge that gap. Right. Um, we have, and, and to sort of find the complement to that, we have an entire membership, we call it a caucus, um, of smaller distributors, um, and we spend time with that group talking about the issues that's smaller, often you know, working within a subset of a single state right. um, up to some of the smaller multi-state distributors right. uh, who you know, we're thinking about what they're looking for mm -hmm. because while some of those, the checklist may look similar, it's probably not identical if I'm you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a given you know, very specific yeah. geographic area. So, we're looking at all of those things um, to bridge that gap. Wonderful, that's great to hear. Any other comments on that? I, um, I always recommend working with your local association. Um, I was really involved with the Santa Cruz Mountain Wine Growers, Growers Association back in the day. Um, I think that there's opportunity, um, you know, everyone kind of says, oh, I'm so, you know, if, it's, if you have a group of, and I've seen this with retailers, especially in New York, Right now, they're looking for unique experiences for their customers to bring people into their, into their stores. And um, in Oregon, they started um, putting together groups of wineries to kind of take these trips and, you know, to go out and, um, you know, sell their, their small production high-end wines in these, you know, go on these almost like tours of retailers in the state. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to be creative and to do those types of things, especially now if you can have the distribution part of it solved, which in our markets you can, if you're a legal wholesale or legal producer, you can get on our platform for very little cost, if any, um, and, and have your wines available for those types of retail trips, which we have started seeing be successful. But um, starting at the local association level can kind of help you with getting together and, and, and doing those, those types of things. Wow, and what a profound idea to sort of change change the lens by which you look at your fellow suppliers that might be right down the street. And you know, we always sort of have the closed door policy of our winery is our winery, and we 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 care about our winery, right? But to be able to open the doors and say, how can we combine our efforts in a way that makes life easier and makes a more compelling experience or story for a retailer or for a wholesaler or for the end consumer? Pretty profound, yeah. right? And, and pretty progressive. And that's consumer, and that's that's consumer full. Like yep. that's what you're doing. You're going yep. out there, you're building relationships with the consumers through a retailer. That's three tier distribution yep. right there. Great. Well, with that, um, we are going to wrap up today. Um, I want to thank this group. We have uh, we have covered a range of thirty thousand foot view topics. Um, lots of innovation happening, and it is super clear that. The, the way that we thought about the industry, the way we went to market, um, even 10 years ago, uh, so many of those same rules don't apply. And so there is a necessity to change along with those times. And um, great to hear three different perspectives around how technology and data are starting to drive those changes and, and will we'll help suppliers think about how to, how to solve for, for the future. So I want to give a round of applause to our speakers. <laughs> And we are going to head into break. Uh, we'll be returning here at 10.15 for understanding the distributor mindset.